All right. Turn that off. All right. The Lord uh, began to share something with me this week. And um, we've been talking about the, uh, we, well, we talked last Wednesday about the mind and the uh, the power of right thinking and how your mind is like, uh, your mind's like the central control unit for everything. Uh, we said uh, it was like the cockpit of a plane. Whoever's in control of the cockpit of the plane controls the direction of the plane, and it's the same way with our mind. Whatever is controlling our mind controls uh, the direction of our life. And so we talked about the key to changing uh, is changing the way we think. It's not just getting saved. That's the beginning of it. But then we've got to renew our mind. And by the renewing of our mind, we're transformed. And and we begin to share a process of transformation that takes place in the soul. And the Lord began to uh, talk to me some more about the mind. And uh, this that, that I want to talk about right here is um, uh, really dealing with the power of right perspective, having a right mental perspective of life. Um, And that's a key to walking in victory. And we see this principle laid out in Genesis chapter 3. Look in Genesis chapter 3. Hallelujah. This, This is a powerful principle. Um, and Satan, uh, understood the power of perspective and, uh, man, he just really attacked it here in Genesis three. And this is really how he spawned the fall of man and the the downfall of mankind. So look in Genesis chapter three. This is where Satan tempts Eve uh, to sin, and then uh, Eve pulls Adam on in to sin and messes up uh, mankind, and we thank God uh, for Jesus, and he fixed it all. Hallelujah. Uh, Let's start reading verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle uh, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, uh, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, uh, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, uh, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, uh, you will not surely die. Now, here's where the attack begins on the perspective. All right, listen. The serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. All right. What is the serpent or what is Satan doing here with the woman? He is, now watch this, he's attacking her perspective of God. He's attacking her perspective of God. How? The woman tells the Satan, look, God said if we eat of this tree, we're going to die. And the serpent comes back and says, you're not going to die. Right there, God is attacking uh, the woman's perspective of the nature of God. Well, God lied to you. God ain't being truthful with you. You're, you're, you're not going to die if you eat of that tree. And in verse 5, 
he continues to attack God's nature and attack the woman's perspective of God. He says, for God knows that when you eat of that tree, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to be as God's knowing good and evil. And in, in other words, here's the thought. Here's the perspective that Satan's trying to build in her mind that God lied to you. And the real reason God doesn't want you to eat of that tree is because he doesn't want you to be like him. He doesn't want you to be gods like him knowing what he knows. Now that was a lie because it did not it wasn't that God didn't want them to be like him or God didn't want them to know about good and evil. God wanted them to know about good and evil, but he didn't want them to learn it by experiencing evil, by sinning and by partaking of the tree. He wanted to teach them through relationship. Amen. He wanted to teach them through relationship. But here's the perspective that Satan's trying to give Eve, that God is holding back from you. God has lied to you. God, his, his, really, God doesn't want you to be like him. God's holding back from you. God's holding out from you. He doesn't want you to eat of that tree because he knows all the wisdom and all the things you're going to get from that tree. And he's trying to keep you low, and he's trying to keep you abased, and he's trying to keep you uh, stupid, basically. So now, what's the perspective that Eve is getting of God? Well, her perspective is becoming, well, maybe God doesn't have our best interest. Maybe he's not really looking out for our good. Maybe he is holding back from us. It, I'm telling you what, that perspective is still in the church today. Maybe he doesn't want to heal me. Maybe he doesn't want me to uh, uh, pay all my bills. Maybe he doesn't want me to have good things. Maybe he doesn't want me to be blessed. And maybe he's trying to teach me a lesson. And, and all. Maybe he's punishing me, you know. And, and so what Satan did here was Satan attacked. Satan didn't walk up to the woman and say, here, why don't you eat of that tree? Yeah. Right? That wouldn't have worked. If it would have, he'd have done it. He'd have said, here, eat of that tree. And she'd, have said, she'd have said, no, God said not to eat of the tree. But how did he get her to step into this rebellion? Is he went after her perspective of God. I believe at the root of every good or bad decision is a right or wrong perspective uh, of who God is. And I, I'll show you this. When, when he attacked Eve's perspective of God, now all of a sudden Eve was looking at that tree and she saw that tree as forbidden, didn't she? She saw it as don't touch it. She even added, God didn't say don't touch it. She added that, but she looked at that tree was so off limits, she wasn't even going to get around it. But after Satan attacked her perspective of God, then her perspective of the tree changed. Are you following what I'm saying? Now her perspective has changed of God, and look at what it says in verse 6. Now when the woman saw the tree, she saw it different. Her whole perspective of the tree changed. Now the tree Looked to her like it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes. It was a tree to be desired, to make one wise. And then she took of the fruit thereof and ate and gave to her husband with her, and he did eat. Here's the principle. Here's the principle. When her perspective of God changed, her perspective of the tree changed. Okay? Uh, your, and here, here it is. Your perception of God is going to determine your perception of the world around you. Your perception of God is going to determine your perception of the world around you. And your perception of the world around you is going to determine your decisions. It's going to determine your responses to life. And it's ultimately going to determine your quality of life. Does everybody understand that? Hallelujah. It starts with our perspective of God. Eve made a decision that spawned the downfall of mankind, and it was a result of a wrong perception of who God was. 
when you don't have a right perception of who God is, you'll have a wrong perception of the world, and a wrong perception of the world will produce wrong decisions and, and bad directions. And I'll show you this so much in here before we get done that you'll you'll see it all. Uh, but but let let's look at this in, in, in a practical manner. Uh, for instance, and this is just basic. If I perceive God as the healer and as the one who put my sickness and disease on Jesus, then how am I going to perceive sickness? You follow what I'm saying? How am I going to perceive sickness? Well, I'm, I, am I, am I going to perceive it as deadly? Am I going to perceive it as something uh, 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 bad that's going to take me out? No, if I perceive him right, if I perceive him as healer, I'm going to perceive sickness as defeated. And now, if I perceive sickness that way, then how am I going to respond to sickness? How am I going to respond to a bad doctor's report? How am I going to, what, 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 how is that going to affect my life? It's not. You follow what I'm saying? But if I don't have a right perspective of God, if I think, if I don't understand God's a healer, if I don't understand it's his will to heal me, if I don't understand that, that, that uh, he already healed me through Christ, then how am I going to perceive sickness? I'm going to perceive sickness as a threat. And how, what's it going to do? It's going to control my life with fear. And it's going to cause me to make decisions that I wouldn't normally make if I had a right perspective of God. You follow what I'm saying? Same way, if I, if I perceive God as provider... Jehovah Jireh, all my needs are met through and by Christ Jesus. Jesus bore my poverty so I could bear his, his uh, state of, of, of wealth and, and, and richness, riches. Then if, if I perceive that, how am I going to perceive financial lack or financial issues or finances, period? Well, I'm not going to perceive, I'm going to perceive them right. I'm going to perce- not perceive them as a problem. And, 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 and what is that going to do for my decisions? Well, money's not going to control me. It's not going to depress me if I don't have it. It's not going to lift me up if I do have it. You follow what I'm saying? Hallelujah. So, listen, right perspective of God, which can only come through right revelation of the word, right perspective of God produces right perspective of the world around us, and a right perspective of the world around us is going to produce in us Right decisions, right responses, right attitudes, right emotions. And then that is going to produce the quality of life that we have. You, you follow? All right. Let, let's look at this. Look in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Lord started talking to me about this. And I said, well, Lord, show me. I mean, he just took me all kinds of places. Look at Exodus chapter 3, look at verse um, 13 and 14. Hallelujah. Um, This is where Moses was called by God to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. All right. Uh, And God's done talked to Moses and told him to go tell the people that uh, I sent you to lead them out. Now, look in verse uh, 13. This was Moses' response to God. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Look at this. Moses says, All right, God, if I go down there, And tell them people you sent me to deliver them. uh, What am I going to tell them? Who am I going to tell them sent me? Now, I don't believe Moses was just asking this for the sake of the people. I believe Moses was asking this for himself. Basically, uh, Moses was saying to God, God, who are you? You're sending me on this assignment. You're sending me down here to, to, to Egypt. You're sending me down here to deliver the people, to talk to Pharaoh and all this stuff. Who are you? And here's the principle again. Moses understood, I need a right perspective of God because if I have a right perspective of God 
a right revelation of who he is, I'm going to have a right perspective of this assignment. See, Moses couldn't get a right perspective of the assignment because he didn't really know yet, who, who am I talking to here? You know, who is this guy? He was raised in Egypt. He was raised under idol worship. And it wasn't until he got older in life that he began to realize, I'm not an Egyptian, I'm a Hebrew. So now he's been 40 years on the backside of the desert, and here's this guy showed up to him in a burning bush and telling him to go on this assignment, and, 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 and he's needing a right perspective of God. Why? Because he needs to perceive this assignment right. Hallelujah. You know, here, here's the thing. A lot of people are wondering, why aren't doors opening for me? And, 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 and why is this not happening and that not happening? Sometimes things are held up because our perspective of God is not right. Because if you don't have a right perspective of God, a strong revelation of who he is, you won't perceive your assignment right. And if you don't perceive your assignment right, uh, you'll fail in it or you'll quit on it. For instance, watch this. I thought it's, it's, it's awesome that God answered Moses you know, there's all kinds of things God could have said when, when, he, when Moses said, who are you? But God summed it up, and he said, I am that I am. Now, if you study that out in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word, uh, the Hebrew that's translated I am, also translates out to become, to become. Uh, and so God was saying to Moses, Moses said, who are you, God? Get ready to go on this assignment. I need a right perspective of you. And God says, I, I become, or we could say God was saying to Moses, I am the becoming one. I am the becoming one. What was God saying to Moses? Moses, I, I become. In other words, I'm the becoming one, or I become whatever you need. Now, why was this key? Why was this perspective, this revelation, why was it important that God revealed himself this way to Moses? Well, where was Moses getting ready to go on his assignment? He was getting ready to lead two to three million Jews into a wilderness where there was no food, no water, water and no shelter. And so what did God say to him? I'm the becoming one. So now what's his perspective of God? God's the become, God becomes whatever I need. Well, isn't that good if your assignment is to go into a wilderness that's uninhabited, uninhabitable, food won't grow, water don't run, it's hot enough to kill you in the day and cold enough to freeze you to death at night? And so what's Moses' perspective of God? He's the becoming one. So now how is he going to perceive the assignment? Oh, this is going to be easy. Well, I, well, I shouldn't say easy, but... This is, this is going to work because if I get out here in the wilderness and I need shelter, he'll become shelter. Come on. If I need water, he'll become water. If I need food, he'll become food. Do you see that? Hallelujah. A right perspective of God gave him a right perspective of the assignment. And a right perspective of the assignment gave him faith and the ability to walk that thing out. And so every time the children of Israel began to complain, what did he do? He went to the becoming one and said, Lord, they're wanting water. And what did God do? God said, go, go up, hit the rock over there. Lord, they're hungry. God said, tell them, get ready. Bread's coming down from heaven. Come on, amen. amen. Hallelujah. And so do you see that? A right perspective of God gives us a right perspective of of the assignment. Let's let's look at somewhere else. Look at First Samuel chapter seventeen. First Samuel chapter seventeen, folks. This is why it's so important to get into the Word of God, renew your mind to the Word of God. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, you. Uh, this is a powerful principle here. A right perspective of God is going to automatically change your perspective of the world, and give you a right perspective of the world. Come on, let me say that. A right perspective of God will give you a right, correct perspective of the world. Hallelujah. Look at this. 1 Samuel chapter 17, look at verse 26. This is where David was facing Goliath, right? Everybody familiar with this? Uh, verse 26, David says, and David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, 
What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? Talking about Goliath who had been 40 days and 40 nights um, uh, out there just trash talking uh, the God of Israel. Uh, what shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? And I want you to catch this word. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Does everybody see that? All right. How did David perceive the giant? David perceived the giant as uncircumcised. The fact that David perceived Goliath as uncircumcised meant that David was thinking of the covenant. David had a covenant perspective, right? And he had a covenant perspective, which meant that his perception of God was a perception of a covenant God. Hallelujah. And a, a perception of a covenant God made him perceive the giant in terms of the covenant. Hallelujah. And in the covenant, David understood God said to Abraham, I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you. Oh, hallelujah. So now, how's David perceiving this whole thing? Wait a minute. According to the covenant... And this covenant God, he cursed Israel. So, as far as I'm concerned, he's cursed. He's in trouble. Are you following what I'm saying? Amen. Now, is and also under the covenant with Abraham, God told him, it says, listen, uh, if your enemies come at you one way, they'll flee seven. Right? So, David didn't perceive the giant as a threat. He didn't perceive the giant as big. He didn't perceive the giant as a champion uh, uh, that has killed all these people, a champion warrior. He simply, watch this, he simply saw the giant in terms of the covenant. To David, that giant was either circumcised or uncircumcised. He was either in the covenant or out of the covenant. Are you following what I'm saying? He didn't see anything else. Nothing else mattered to David. Nothing else. His size didn't matter. The, the size of his weapons didn't matter. His track record, his history of war experience didn't matter. All that mattered to David was, is he in the covenant or out of the covenant? You follow what I'm saying? And in this case, he's out of the covenant. He's uncircumcised. And he's coming against those that are in the covenant. So David didn't, it didn't, nothing else mattered to David. His perspective of the giant was, you're dead. You are a walking dead man because you have touched the covenant children of God. Listen, I, I thought about this. Listen to me. When you've got the right perception of God, it will narrow your perception down to what really matters. Are you following me? When, because David had a right perception of God, a covenant God, it narrowed his perception of the giant down to what mattered. And all that mattered was this. He was not a covenant child of God, and he was coming against those in the covenant. So he's dead. He's cursed. It's over. Are you following me? This works in our life, folks. For instance, you might perceive a situation and say, well, when you perceive it, oh, man, it's just it's too much for me to handle. It's too big. I got to deal with this, and I got to deal with that, and I got to deal with this. Are you following what I'm saying? When you're seeing all the problems... When you're seeing all the issues of the thing that you're facing, you've got a wrong perception. Hallelujah. And what you have to do in those moments is you have to renew your mind to who God is. And when you renew your mind to who God is, that right perception of God will narrow your perception down of this thing you're facing. Are you following me? Hallelujah. And you won't worry about this and that and what's going wrong over here and what's going wrong over there. As far as you're concerned, it will just be a situation that must come under your feet. 
Hallelujah. And work out for your good because you love God and are called according to his purpose. See, David's perception of the giant changed. It was narrowed down to what mattered when he had a right perception of God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I thought about sometimes on when I took, take these ministry trips. I've taken ministry trips. And I've never thought about distance. I've never thought about time. I've never thought about money. I've never thought about the condition of the car, where I was going to stay, how it was going to work out, because God said go. And because God said go, and I had a right perception of who God was or is, my provider, then this thing, it, I didn't notice all that. It just looked, all it looked like was doable. It narrowed my perception down to it as just a successful a son, because of my perception of God. Look, I love this. Look in verse 40. And this is when David went out to meet the giant. He took his staff in his hand, chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. He, he, he didn't look like he was going to war against Goliath. He looked like he was going out to meet a, a, a dog or a wolf or something that come up on the sheep, right? And the Philistine came on and drew near to David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and, and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? that thou comest to me with staves, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So how did David perceive the giant? David perceived the giant as nothing but a defeated dog. Hallelujah. And then we understand that David won that battle that day, but it was not because of who he was, but it was because of his perception of the giant which was based on his right perception of this covenant God he was serving. Folks, it's not the size of something that is facing you. It's not the size of the deficit. It's not the size of the problem. It's not the size of, of, uh, of, uh, of what you've got to uh, conquer or, or, or deal with. It, that's not what stops us. Or, or causes us to be successful. What stops us or causes us to be successful is our perception. Your perception of it is what will stop you. Your perception of your obstacle is what will take you out. Hallelujah. But what affects our perception of something is our perception of God. Hallelujah. And so we've got to keep a right perception of God. We've got to renew our minds. We've got to stay in the Word because a right perception of God is going to continue to give us a right perception of our, our situations. And it is perception that stops us or causes us to succeed. Look in Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, this is... This is good. Hallelujah. Numbers chapter 13. Hallelujah. Numbers chapter 13. Look in verse 27. This is where uh, Joshua sent 12, or Moses sent 12 spies over into the land to spy out the land before they were to go in and, and possess it and take it. And 12 spies went in, and, and look here in verse 27. This is what they said when they came back. They told him and said, We came to the land where thou sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. And the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. Hallelujah. Does everybody see his, their perception? They're perceiving all the giants. They're perceiving all the obstacles. And Caleb 
stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we're well able to overcome it. But then uh, the men went up, but the, but the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people. They're stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that uh, we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come from the giant, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. All right. I read all that to say this. Twelve men went up and saw the same thing. Now, two of these men, Joshua and Caleb, had a different perspective than the other ten. And the other ten had a different perspective than Joshua and Caleb. So, twelve people saw the same thing, but ten of them had one perspective of it, and two of them had another perspective of it. What's, what is the factor here? The perception of God. Hallelujah. Two people can see, be facing the same problem, and one can see it as defeated or nothing and laugh at it. The other sees it, and they're just tore up by it. They're just broken down by it. And the the determining factor, the root of it, is their perception of God. Are you following what I'm saying? So now, here we see that ten of these men, hallelujah, uh, said, we can't go up. These giants in the land are stronger than us. Their perception was... We're like grasshoppers compared to them. That was their perception of themselves. And then they perceived that that's how the giants see us, as grasshoppers. If we go up in there, their inhabitants, they eat up the land, which meant they'll devour us. They'll squash us like bugs. We're nothing. That was ten of those men's perception. Hallelujah. But we find that Caleb said in verse 30... He said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we're well able to overcome it. And then you see over in Numbers 14, verses 8 and 9, look over there. This is Joshua and Caleb speaking to the people. Joshua and Caleb says, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us. A land which flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. And so what we find that Joshua and Caleb's perception was. Is they're bred for us. Meaning we can eat them up. We'll devour them. Hallelujah. And their perception was God is with us. God will give us the city. Their perception was their defense is gone. They're afraid of us. Hallelujah. Now, where did this perception come from? Well, it came from a right perception of God. They told him in verse 8, if the Lord delight in us, then he'll bring us into this land. They wasn't saying, when they said if the Lord delight in us, it wasn't like, it wasn't a guess. It wasn't, uh, they wasn't saying it like, well, you know, if the Lord is pleased with us, then he'll bring us into the land. It, was, it wasn't that. It was a, it was a, a confidence. It would be like saying if uh, I came up to my kids and we needed to leave in 10 minutes and they were sitting there watching TV like they usually are and not dressed, I would come up to them and I'd say, look, if we need to leave in 10 minutes, don't you think you need to start getting dressed? Well, there's no question about whether we need to leave. In t- I, when I said if, that wasn't a question. Right? That was a statement. You know, if we need to leave in 10 minutes, which we do, then you need to get dressed. Right? That's what Josh was saying. If God delights in us, he wasn't saying, he wasn't a question in his mind. He said, look, you know, because the Lord delights in us, because he's pleased with us, because he's with us, he'll give us the city. So what was, what was uh, uh, Joshua and Caleb's perception of God? That God's for us. Man, through the whole trip in the wilderness, the children of Israel complained as if, what did God say that they did? They tempted him. They tested him. Why? 
because they didn't think he was with them. So when they got here to the city, because of a wrong perception of who God is, and they perceived God as not being for them and being against them and trying to kill them, you know, they said, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here in the wilderness to die, right? Their perception was God's trying to kill us. And so when they got to the land, their perception was, we'll die. The giants will eat us up and devour us. But Joshua and Caleb's perception was, hallelujah, God's with us. God's pleased with us, and therefore, we'll take the city. Right? Now, the rest of the children of Israel took on the perception of the ten spies. And they wandered in the wilderness on the edge of their promise. How many does not want to wander on the edge? They wandered on the edge of their promise for 40 years and died and never got it. But Joshua and Caleb, hallelujah, they were part of that generation that came out with Moses, but they didn't die in the wilderness. God kept them. Why? Perspective. Folks, it, it wasn't the giants that kept them out of the land. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't anything but their perspective of the promised land, which was rooted in a wrong perspective of God. That's what I'm saying. Perspective is the key. Problems aren't big enough to stop you. Lack's not big enough to stop you. Sickness is not big enough to stop you. The one thing that stops people and hinders people is their perspective of what they're dealing with, which is rooted in a wrong perspective of God. But if you've got a right perspective of God, you'll perceive your world right, and that changes everything. Hallelujah. See, when, you know, walking in faith and releasing faith is really a response to a right perspective. I'm responding to a right perspective. I don't see this sickness as getting on me and killing me because God's my healer. So now, because of that, my response of faith is to declare I'm healed. My response of faith is to walk on just like nothing is wrong. You see? Hallelujah. And then if, if, then if I can release that faith, I can release the supernatural power of God. But it's all perspective. Are you seeing that? What kept the children of Israel out of, out of Israel? Perspective. What kept Joshua and Caleb through the wilderness and ultimately brought them in and they got what God promised? Perspective. That was the key. Are you following that? Now, I want, you, I want to point something out before I move to this last uh, scripture here in Hebrews. But I want you to notice something. Look at this. Look in verse 33. The, the people that went in and saw the giants, look at their perspective real quick. It says, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. Numbers 13, verse 33. And look what they said, so we were in their sight. Right? Now, <clears throat> their perception was that we are like grasshoppers compared to these giants. And they perceived that the giants saw them the same way, right? These giants see us as grasshoppers. They're not afraid of us. They're confident. They're ready to whip, whip us and destroy us, right? Hallelujah. But this was not true. Look in Joshua chapter 2. Look in Joshua chapter 2 real quick. Joshua chapter 2. This is this is where uh, the children of Israel that came out with Moses died in the wilderness. The ones 21 and under were spared. And Joshua was kept. And now Joshua's taken a new generation into the promised land. And Joshua goes ahead and sends spies over into Jericho to spy out the land. And the spies end up being hid in Rahab the harlot's house. We was preaching about that Sunday night. Uh, and she kept them there because the people of the city had, had heard they were in there and they were looking for these spies. 
And I want you to look at what Rahab said to the spies. Look at verse 8 and 9 of Joshua chapter 2. It says, And before they were laid down, she came up to them upon the roof. She was hiding the spies upon the roof. And she said unto, unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. Now She was already in the land when they first came over, right? I know the Lord hath given you the land, and that, watch this, your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what ye did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon, as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Do you see that? They, the children of Israel had a perspective back in Numbers 13 that we're grasshoppers. These men see us as grasshoppers. They're going to eat us up. They're not afraid of us. But was that the right perspective? No. Found out in Joshua chapter 2 that when everybody in the land heard what God did with the Red Sea and, 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 the, and the people, the enemies that come against them in the wilderness, Rahab said, Everybody's hearts melted. There was no defense left in anybody. They knew God was going to destroy them. They were scared out of their mind. So, what kept the children of Israel, the, the first generation, out? It wasn't the giants because if they'd have walked up there basically and said, Boo, the giants would have dropped everything and handed it over. Why? They were scared out of their mind. So if the first generation would have had the right perspective and then responded to that perspective and went into the, whole, went to the, uh, the promised land, they would have took the city. You follow what I'm saying? Here's something the Lord spoke to me. Because they had a wrong perception of God which gave them a wrong perception of the people. And they perceived these people see us as grasshoppers. Well, it was a wrong perspective. And the Lord spoke to me and said, Sean, you cannot trust any perspective that's not rooted in a right perspective of God. Let me say that again. You cannot trust any perspective that's not rooted in a right perception of who God is. Hallelujah. Any perception, if you had, listen, if you're going through something, and, and listen, you know, you can't even, you can't even believe the facts. You know, the facts will come up, and all the facts will point to, 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 to this truth and say, you know, uh, this is what's going to happen. Look at all the facts. Look at all the evidence. And, and they'll say, this is the right perception you need to have. No. You can't even trust that perception. The only perception you can trust is a perception that comes out of a right perception of who God is. Hallelujah. And if you're going through something and things are looking this way or that way, if you haven't renewed your mind to a right perception of God, or if you don't have a right perception of God, you can't trust that perception you have of that situation. Are you following what I'm saying? Hallelujah. It's, it, 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 it's very, very misleading. It will cause you to make decisions you shouldn't make. Yeah, but, when, but this and that, and you can give all the reasons you can. Hallelujah. But many times, those perceptions that we have if we haven't renewed our mind to a right perception of God, many times those perceptions we have are very misleading and will keep us out of a lot of things. Hallelujah. That's what kept the children of Israel out of, of uh, the, the promised land. Their perception lied to them. Their perception lied to them. But if they'd have had a right perception like Joshua and Caleb had, 
Joshua said, man, Joshua had the right perception. Joshua said, they're bread for us. Basically, what Joshua was saying is, we will eat them for breakfast. We'll devour them. We'll eat them up. We'll swallow them. They'll be no more when we get done with them. Whose perspective was right? Well, according to Rahab, Joshua and Caleb's perspective was right. And the rest of everybody else's perspective was wrong. Look in one last place, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Are, are y'all got anything out of this? Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. Are we, are we perceiving things right based on a right perception of who God is? Is your perception based on the evidence that you see with your natural senses, or is it based on your perception of who God is? You gotta, you gotta ask yourself those questions in life. Amen. Hebrews chapter eleven. Um, let's see. I want you to see. Um, and I just want you to see this real quick. Let's see. I gotta find it here. Um, verse eleven. Verse 11, through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when, everybody say when, when she was past age because, and this is, this right here is going to tell us why she received strength to conceive a child when she was too old. It was because she judged him faithful who had promised. Watch this. Here's what this is saying. Sarah was past the age. She was uh, around 100 years old. And her womb had been barren all of her life. So she didn't just have the age thing against her. She had some medical complications, some physical complications. She was never able to bear children. And now she's 100 years old. She's not only too old to have children and to push them out. She's not fertile enough. She don't have no milk. But this says... She received strength. Now, what kind of strength did she receive to conceive a child at 100 years old? Supernatural strength, wasn't it? She received supernatural ability to get pregnant, to birth a child out, and to, to uh, nurse it. Because why? When did this happen? What released all this? She judged him faithful who had promised. In other words, she accounted him. She saw God as faithful who had promised. This is Sarah who laughed initially at the promise of God. Right? This is Sarah who said, I'll never have a child. Abraham, go sleep with my, my maidservant, Hagar. And now because of that, we got... Uh, problems with uh, with Ishmael's seed and and we got wars and terrorists and all that stuff and so but when she finally watched this when she finally perceived God right are you following me what happened the power to bring the promise of God to pass the supernatural miracle working power was released upon right perception are you following me oh hallelujah hallelujah i don't know i'm not a scholar but i got to looking at this one day and i thought you know what i don't think you know the bible says abraham staggered not at the promise of god and you say well he slept with hagar yeah but he did that uh for sarah I think Sarah was the one staggering at the promise of God, and Sarah probably held this thing up. Because it says, finally, finally, when she perceived God right, 
that unlocked supernatural power. Folks, I'm telling you, a right perception of God unlocks everything. It changes everything. It's like the uh, the uh, Mio commercial where they squirt the Mio in the water. And the guy's like, it changed or changes the water. And he says, it changes everything. <laughs> a, I'm telling you, a right perspective of God changes everything. I think a lot of times stuff is held up, and it's held up based on our perception. Hallelujah. Our perception of God which affects our perception of the world around us, which that perception of the world around us affects our decisions and responses to life, and those decisions and responses to life affect our quality of life, what we have and what's released in our life. Hallelujah. So if we can get right perception of God, we'll have right perception of the world, and right perception of the world will produce right responses, right decisions, and it will unlock the power of God that will... uh, just release the life of God to us. Uh, Jesus said something, and we'll pray. Jesus said something. He said, uh, he said, eternal life, and, and I was going to read the scripture, but I didn't put it down in my notes, and, but it's coming to me, that eternal life is to know God. Eternal life is to know God. And basically, eternal life is not, when the Bible talks about eternal life or life everlasting, eternal life, folks, is not just living forever. That's not what eternal life is. Eternal life is not just living forever, and eternal life doesn't begin when we go to heaven or after we die or after the Lord comes back. Eternal life is, begins at salvation because life the life that that the greek uh is talking about there when they translated life from the greek is zoe the word zoe means the god kind of life a blessed life a life of health a life of peace a life uh of of uh, living eternally a life of a relationship with god and so the scripture says knowing God, not getting to heaven, and, and all, but knowing God, when you come into a revelation of God, that is eternal life. A revelation of who God is produces the life of God in your life. And so what that's saying is to us that it's our perspective of who God is, it's our revelation of who God is, that's going to produce ultimately the life of God in us and to us and through us. Hallelujah. So, let's say it one more time. Let's, let's get it one more time. A right perspective of God produces a right perspective of the world. Hallelujah. And a right perspective of the world will produce right decisions... Will pr- that will produce the best quality of life. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So, Satan is still working today the way he worked in the garden. Saying, if I can get a hold of their perspective of God and mess with it, then they'll see the world different. And if they see the world different, they'll make some bad choices. And that ba- those bad choices will mess with their quality of life. Hallelujah. Let's see if this works. 